Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining PropFlow's Green Homes webinar series for mortgage advisors, finance and property professionals to understand more about how brokers can engage property owners to green their homes. Great to know so many of you are listening today, so thanks for joining us. I'm Pam Barbato, founder of Action Net Zero, community interest company. Our purpose is to help accelerate sustainable change, and our mission is to empower communities, people and businesses to take affordable actions to tackle the climate and ecological crises. I'm delighted to be facilitating today's webinar, joined by our expert panel, who I'll introduce shortly. But in today's session, we'll be exploring how can brokers engage property owners? and specifically looking at the role of brokers and intermediaries in supporting customers to green their homes. You know, what are the opportunities and the benefits for them? And when's a good time to start the engagement process? So thinking about how brokers can support property owners actually throughout their journey. We'll also be looking at how energy efficiency affects affordability and shining a light on some great impactful improvements that homeowners can take. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about general points of the webinar now. So you can hear us um, and we can't hear you, which is perfectly normal. We'll expect the webinar to last about an hour. Um, we've got questions. You can use uh, ask questions at any time using two uh, sets of functionality. If you've arrived on the Riverside app, you'll see a little speech mark, which you can click and enter the chat. And if you joined through LinkedIn, then please post the questions in the comments. Uh, we'll have a dedicated session after we've heard from our panellists. Um, we're also recording the session and we'll circulate it to you all afterwards so you can watch it back. So on to the programme for today. Um, it's great, uh, well, unfortunately, Rosie Fish, uh, Fish from Habito, who was due to be joining us through unforeseen circumstances, unfortunately can't join us, but it's my pleasure to now invite the rest of our panel. We've got Luke Loveridge, founder and CEO of PropFlow. James Chutter, Corporate Account Manager, Leeds Building Society. Andrew Parkin, Technical Development Director, Elmhurst Energy. And Richard Merritt, Managing Director from Alexander Hall. It'd be great if each of you can now tell us a little bit more about yourselves and your roles, please. So handing over to Luke first. Yeah, thanks, Pam. And yeah, welcome, everyone. I'm Luke Loveridge, the founder and CEO of PropFlow. Uh, and we provide essentially a retrofit as a service so that you can actually uh, concentrate on what you're good at, which is providing financing and assisting your customers uh, so that you don't have to worry about that complex end-to-end -end process, which is energy efficiency and, and improving, improving your homes. Um, so we were the first one-stop shop in uh, a, a mortgage lender, an estate agent, and a mortgage broker. So we've got quite a lot of expertise in, in the industry. And together, we're uh, engaging over 1.4 million uh, homeowners. That's me, Pam. Brilliant. Thanks, Luke. James, would you like to come in? Good morning, everyone. My name is James Chatter. I'm a corporate account manager from Leeds Building Society. Uh, I've been in the industry around 15 years, and my key role is working uh, and networking between the major mortgage broker clubs and, and networks. But I also work very closely with the Green Finance Institute, uh, and I'm also part of the Mortgage Climate Action Group. So I've got a really keen interest uh, around green mortgage, green lending, and how we can sort of use this space to help towards a, a better future, really. Brilliant. Thanks, James. And Andrew? Uh, good morning, everyone. Andrew Parkin. I am here uh, on behalf of uh, a company called Elmhurst Energy. I'm the technical director there, and um, our business uh, specialises in uh, the provision of energy performance certificates. Uh, we're one of the accreditation bodies in the UK, and we have 15,000 members approximately producing over a million EPCs and other reports uh, annually. Great. Thank you. And last but not least, Richard. Morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Richard Merritt, Managing Director of Alexander Hall. Uh, we're one of London's largest mortgage uh, advice firms, uh, responsible for uh, over £2 billion worth of lending last year. Um, very close to the purchase market, first-time buyers, um, sister company of Fox and so lots and lots of people um, who are uh, acquiring homes. Um, in the green capacity, I also chair the Mortgage Climate Action Group, which is a, a group of dis primarily distributors, but industry experts um, who are working together, collaborating to raise awareness um, about the part that mortgages uh, and our market can play in driving sustainability. 
Brilliant. Thank you all. As I'm sure you'll agree, a fantastic panel of experts for our discussion today. So we're now going to share three short presentations um, with some of the panel questions in between before we actually start our live Q&A. So Luke, it'd be great if you could start. I know you're going to be sharing insights on why, when and how brokers can engage customers on greening their homes. Sure. Let me just share my screen. <coughs> Is that showing? All good. Uh, yes. H hello, everyone. Uh, in this presentation, I will be briefly covering some key trigger points uh, to engage your customers in retrofitting and in including some examples. Uh, but first, apart from being a good thing to do, I just want to briefly recap on why you should be engaging your customers in energy efficiency. Uh, so firstly, demand is rising. Solar panels uh, installations have increased nearly 700% in the last four years, and heat pump deployments are, are also increasing. And this has been driven by higher energy bills, government targets, and increasing incentives. Uh, by considering the longer term needs of your customers, you'll also be delivering added value, which in turn can help increase your brand reputation and, and retention. And I think importantly, it's also an area where you could potentially grow revenue. So you could potentially make, based on our estimates, over £700 per property from incentives provided by improvement suppliers. So there, there is a real opportunity there. Uh, so when is the best time to engage your customers? So there are a number of different trigger points where homeowners and landlords could be naturally engaged. Uh, for example, their boiler breaks down or when they retire and they're looking for reduced bills. Uh, what I'll be touching upon briefly uh, are new purchases, remortgages and compliance. So in terms of new purchases, 47% of Britons are looking to make improvements to their homes. And the first year after purchase is usually an important time uh, where people do renovations. Uh, so a really good example here is where Yopa has been quite innovative, actually, with buyers, where they wait a few weeks after the exchange of contracts, and then they send our Green Vowel Retrofit tool to their customers. And this forms part of a, a wider welcome pack of services to the new owners that Yopa provides. This is a market-leading retrofit tool that enables people to view a report on their property, select improvements, and then get direct quotes from um, improvement suppliers at the right time. There's also a large wave of people remortgaging this year, so especially um, you know, encountering higher rates than that they've been used to. Um, so Habito, we've worked with, um, they've used our portfolio audit tool to actually analyze their existing customers to develop tailored messaging for people who are due to remortgage within the next six months. Again, they then use our green retrofit tool to engage, and then they track uh, progress uh, of that of engagement with that tool as well. This means the homeowner is much better informed about additional borrowing needs prior to remortgaging, uh, and then they can get the most appropriate product for those, those their longer term needs. <clears throat> And for private landlords, although the current government um, you know, minimum energy efficiency standards is uh, you know, b being scrapped, uh, the current ones are still in force. So that's a, a currently an E uh, to be able to rent out. Uh, and the government still has a target for all properties to be upgraded to at least an energy rating of C by 2035. Uh, so we work with Molo, who's primarily a buy-to-let lender. And they used, our, again, our portfolio audit tool to identify pro properties at risk now and in the future. And then again, they've used our green bar retrofit tool to then engage those higher risk properties. So what are some considerations when engaging customers in retrofit? <clears throat> Just to summarize. Firstly, understanding the risks and opportunities that your customers uh, is, is really useful, um, and particularly uh, to tailor targeting uh, um, on specific segments of your customers, which will most likely be um, wanting to retrofit. Uh, secondly, getting an understanding of where you can best ra raise awareness in your customer journeys is really important. And then understanding what tools and resources can be used at different points. Obviously, we've got a set, but there are other tools out there as well. Uh, and lastly, energy efficient retrofitting isn't just a one time transaction. People you know, might get loft insulation one year. Uh, a couple of years later, they might get solar. When their boiler breaks down, they, they might want to replace it with a heat pump. So all of the, these uh, improvements might need financing. So it's a really great opportunity to essentially be there for your customers when, when they need that at the right time. Uh, thank you for listening. 
Great, thanks, Luke. Um, some really interesting insights there, not least the 47% of new homeowners planning to renovate and 1.5 million um, of fixed rate mortgages coming to an end in 2024. So clearly some brilliant opportunities for brokers to start to have those conversations. So it'd be great to now kickstart the panel discussion by actually focusing on the role of brokers in greening our housing stocks. So Richard, over to you if you'd like to give us some outline from your perspective. Yeah, sure. So um, I think the first starting point is you know, how crucial brokers are in the entire um, mortgage and home buying process. You know, um, the intermediary market now accounts for in excess of 85% of all mortgages done. Um, I think the level of complexity that we've seen sort of post COVID and through uh, the rising interest rate climate um, really sort of demonstrates the, the value of advice and the, the, the crucial role that brokers play. Um, so, yeah, they are the frontline people that are going to be talking to, to most customers. And um, here, um, yeah, the, 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 the role of a broker is to sort of try and help people save money. Right. Um, and yeah, with rising interest rates, that's pretty tough at the moment. Um, uh, but yeah, the, the industry has sort of focused on um, large scale retrofit. But there's actually lots and lots of things that um, customers can do. You know, small behavioral changes, small cost effective changes that they can make to their home that can actually save them money on their energy bills. And therefore, I, I personally believe that brokers have a responsibility to become more aware of that and be the touch point for those customers. I think the one key point to make is brokers are not expected to be green experts. You know, they, they, they are mortgage experts and they provide the finance solutions. Um, if a, if a, a customer is keen to explore what they can do, then the broker should be um, uh, introducing or facilitating them to the appropriate um, uh, tools or education to, to, for the customer then to understand the green choices that they want to make. Brilliant. Thanks, Richard. I think it's a really nuanced piece, isn't it? You know, how much information is the right amount of information for brokers to be able to obviously pass on to those customers? So I would actually really like to ask that question more widely. What and how much information do we think that non-retrofit and energy professionals, you know, brokers in particular, need to know about those home improvements to support their customers? So, Andrew, um, obviously, it'd be great to hear from you in terms of your thoughts around that. What is good knowledge um, and where does it then get passed over uh, to those subject matter experts around those um, improvements? Absolutely, yes. Um, uh, let me just share my screen. Um, I did have literally on the right bit and then it's disappeared off my screen. <laughs> there we go. OK, um, I'm going to do a whistle stop tour of, of, of that subject matter. I think I want to tell you a bit of about the why and the what uh, as much as anything, because some of this is going to matter at some point to uh, certain people. So um, just a bit of knowledge around EPCs as much as anything. I don't know if, how well this is known, but there are actually two types of EPC. There's a domestic one and a non-domestic one, and they focus on different things and therefore what the EPC says and how people use them and how people um, uh, attribute value to them is different. So we're predominantly focusing on domestic matters here. Um, and the focus of a domestic EPC is around fuel poverty. And the cost of fuel is really important in that A to G rating appears on the EPC. And if you have that in the back of your mind, when we look at heat pumps in a second, that'll make a, a bit of sense. Um, they are an asset rating and they are allow, they, they allow people to compare one property with another. You don't have any consideration about the people living in those buildings. Um, so it's literally just what what is the asset and what rating is that asset. They, they are valid for 10 years. This may change and I'll cover that in a second as well. Um, and also it's important not to rely on older information that may be out of date. Um, I think that's a really important message to take away is that the EPC is only as accurate as at the time of the survey and things may have changed and therefore the picture and what, what, what is being advised to the homeowner may change as well, or the prospective homeowner, should I say. Um, and there is quite a lot of change coming in our industry. So we've got an EPC reform consultation, which is due very soon. Um, that could be bef just before summer. Um, we're hoping to see it this year at the very least. And there's a load of things wrapped up in there about how we're going to change the EPC and make it more effective for its future uses. We're also got a new methodology coming this year, which is about how d does the EPC get put together? What, what goes into the calculation? It is going to be more accurate. It is going to take longer to produce and there's going to be some impact on cost uh, around how those EPCs um, are produced. So I expect them to be more costly in the future we're expecting to see that sometime this year around summertime um, and we'll, we'll be able to get data out uh, when we as and when we know it 
further on from that, we've got a brand new model coming into the market called the home energy model. Um, it's uh, under consultation at the moment, and that really will change the game and move us towards um, more accurate modeling and a better understanding of how buildings perform so that we can make some really, really good decisions on buildings. But as it is, we're in a sort of a transition phase at the moment. Just remember, change is coming. Um, why is all this happening? Because we're moving towards our legally binding target for being net zero by 2050. And that means decarbonization and moving away from fossil fuels. So if you've got a gas burning boiler in your property at some point between now and 2050, so quite a long period of time, we're going to see a shift away from those boilers to uh, renewable heating systems of some kind, decarbonized uh, heating. Um, so it is a transition. It is moving towards electric. Uh, there's different ways of using electric to heat our homes, um, heat pumps being a pr primary one, but there are other others. And also that also impacts on how we transport ourselves around the country. Um, uh, our, our cars are moving towards electric vehicles. Again, there are other technologies out there. Um, so it's all sort of swirling around at the moment. We are in this period of transition. Um, in amongst that is the EPC, which helps us identify uh, to a prospective homeowner uh, what could be done to improve the building in terms of energy efficiency. Um, and these recommendations appear on the EPC um, sort of halfway through. They're designed um, to be, uh, they, they, they manifest themselves when the, the recommendation saves uh, somebody some money um, and it creates an improvement to the EPC rating. Um, some of the measures, like a heat pump, don't necessarily do that. They actually reduce the amount of carbon emissions, which again is not a primary focus of a domestic EPC. So they may or may not appear. And at the moment, things like heat pumps don't appear, but that is changing. So again, another point of change, we're going to see different recommendations coming onto the EPC. Um, so again, bear that one in mind. So in terms of what's important in, in, in terms of interventions, uh, packages of measures, um, it's important that a measure uh, packages are installed in the correct way, um, in the correct order. So you wouldn't necessarily want to change a heating system without first in thinking about the, the fabric. It's called a fabric first intervention. Um, and you want to maximize benefit uh, to the, the, the new occupant. Um, also, there's a consideration around disruption. Um, so you don't want to do one measure and then two months later do another measure and, and, and have a similar level of disruption. I also want to make sure that we're adding value to the property as well and talk about return on investment, but also um, how things affect the, uh, the net present value of, of the property. Um, what, we, um, what we want to end up with is um, a, a sort of like a, 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 a sensible intervention for each property in the UK over the next 30 years. We want a, a good level of insulation. In some properties, that's possible. Some properties, it's, it's not so easy. Um, we want to move towards a low carbon, net zero uh, heating source, like a heat pump. Um, we need to think about the ventilation of the property because as you seal it up, we need, we need to ventilate better. Um, and certainly things like PVs, uh, solar power, uh, batteries, uh, that could be the car, uh, but some form of storage within the property seems really, really sensible. So that's a, what a good package probably looks like. We'll just pull away on some of those individually. Insulation is is a win-win-win. Um, it, it it saves money, it saves energy, it saves carbon. The problem is it's not always easy to justify on a return of on investment point of view because it's a, it's got a long pay payback period and it's quite expensive, um, but it should add to the asset value. Solar PV is really compelling. A lot of people don't understand it, so that's a, that's a big tick in the box. Um, it saves money straight away. Um, you can store the energy that's generated on there and use it at appropriate times. You can also sell it back to the grid. Um, it's, it's there uh, to be appreciated uh, from the outside of the building, so people get it. Um, and I certainly feel, and I think others will agree, it adds value to the property as well. So again, really, really compelling um, measure. Heat pumps are more difficult. Heat pumps work. I hate I hate it when we hear the bad press about how they don't work. They don't work because people don't really understand how they are designed to work. Um, but a correctly sized heat pump is designed to be really, really efficient, run at about four times the efficiency of a gas boiler. So they work. The problem we have at the moment is electricity is about four times more expensive than gas. So really, they're only about, if you get it right, pretty much replacing that boiler without any detriment to the, the occupant. Uh, it shouldn't cost them more, but it could. 
because it's you know they are the way that they're designed to work um they work at lower flow temperature and therefore should be more efficient you've got to get that right um and ideally you want to team that up with some good levels of insulation as well so um uh, there's going to be some examination of that, some changes potentially to the way that um, uh, fuel prices are in this country. But until that point, really, it's just about making sure when we, we install a heat pump in a property, it's no more expensive than the gas alternative. What it does do, it saves a whole heap of carbon, which is fantastic. Um, and some people will really prioritize that and understand that. There are obviously some uh, incentives out there at the moment to make the, the equation of cost of install work um, and in therefore therefore there should be some um, appreciation that that can add value to the property and probably won't cost as much as that value has been added to the property. EPCs are going to start recommending them soon. They're not a, they're not a recommendation that you see on EPCs at the moment, but that is coming. So please bear that one in mind. So just to sort of summarize, um, EPC results um, are, are, are signed to impact the value of a uh, the perceived value of a property. Um, buyers are starting to recognise that they're starting to prioritise the EPC rating a little bit more, um, and uh, and there's more awareness. I think because of the cost of fuel and the the, the cost of energy crisis. Um, and up to date EPC is really important because things change at a property. The EPC it's, itself is going to change this year, so you've got a nine-year-old EPC um, and then, um, uh, you know, we're going to selling a property in the, in the next uh, six months. It's probably worth getting an up-to-date EPC anyway, because of that, that, that fact. And the new methodology will have some impact. Um, we should get more accurate assessments. The survey is going to take more time um, and we're going to see new recommendations, particularly heat pumps appearing on the EPC. Um, make the most of your energy assessor. They are the experts. They're the ones who understand uh, what goes into an EPC and what makes the big differences. Um, and at a time of change, that's really, really useful. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I think what you've demonstrated there to that original question of actually how much information do brokers need to know to engage there is complex, isn't it? It's hugely complex. But the critical piece here is that there's a huge opportunity from both a cost and a carbon perspective to be able to start to have that conversation with their customers um, and then uh, point them in the right direction in terms of that subject matter expertise. Um, and flagging obviously those EPC pieces. So I think um, in terms of those interventions, we'll come back to some Q&A live questions in a bit, but uh, moving on to our third presentation, that's going to be to James, is going to be talking um, to us about the role of energy efficiency in homes, specifically in supporting affordability for new, for new builds um, in particular. So James, if you'd like to do your presentation. Thanks very much, Pam. What I'm going to do is take five minutes just to talk you through around um, Leeds Building Society, sort of groundbreaking um, way of assessing affordability for new build and therefore more energy efficient properties. But I want to give you a sort of a bit of a backstory as to how we came about looking at this. Um, so uh, at Leeds Building Society, um, putting home ownership within reach of more people generation after generation is our purpose. And therefore we are very focused around first time buyers. And the aim of this slide is to try and help uh, help you understand the sort of plight that first time buyers are facing at the moment. Um, the slide uses uh, some ONS data um, based on the average house price in England uh, versus the average salary going back as far as 1953. And the average house price uh, back in 1953 stood at a whopping 1,692 with the average salary being 333 pounds. So that worked out as around five times salary. Fast forward um, to 2022 or 2023, and the average house price now stands at uh, just shy of 290,000 with the average salary being at around 34,000. So you're at 8.52 times salary. So this particularly has an impact on first time buyers, especially, and also young people and their ability to get a foothold onto the housing ladder um, with rates of home ownerships between the ages of 25 and 34 have pretty much collapsed over the last 30 years and the average deposit that's required for um, a first-time buyer has gone from 
uh, around sort of 62,000 uh, and is now sort of jumping up. There were some figures out from TSB which show it's nearly at 70,000 now. So it's taken even longer for someone to save for a deposit around sort of 10 years. And it's likely that they're going to need some form of help from their parents, whether it be that they get a gift from their parents or that they're going to be living for them rent free. Um, so it's one of the major issues here is that there isn't enough housing stock in the UK and there isn't enough home be homes being built. And we estimate from our own research that over the next 15 years, that the UK is going to require a further 5 million homes on an average of around 340,000 a year, which is um, way above what the government's current so target, uh, which hasn't been achieved since uh, 1971. So it means that housing is probably at least affordable for around 150 years. And uh, it means that we need to do uh, more about it. And so at Leeds Building Society, uh, we've started to take that look of how can we help support this uh, first time buyer uh, market. Um, but we've also got the other sort of um, challenge at the moment in that we need to sort of uh, move towards being carbon neutral as a business. So it means that, you know, as we've all sort of stated before, that we need to reduce our carbon footprint by 50% by 2030 and then get to carbon neutral by 2050. So like all lenders, we're working on our carbon emissions, the, the different scopes of one, two and three. Um, and scope three in particular is the one that, that's probably going to be most relevant today is that because um, that's based on our sort of wider supply chain, which includes our mortgage properties. Um, so um, yeah. when thinking about that, it's like, how are we going to be able to bring uh, our average EPC rating up? Um, you know, the average UK EPC rating at the moment, from what I understand, is a D. Uh, you know, how are we going to bring that up to a C to be able to reduce the amount of carbon uh, that our properties are using in the UK at the moment? So this led to us looking at ways at how um, if we were to help people buy energy, more energy efficient homes, what um impacts will it have on their actual costs and then how can we fix that into affordability so i draw your attention onto the slide to um the bit just in the middle epcd there's a yellow bit shows that the average um uh, bill for 2022 was 1179 pounds um, but from looking at the ONS data that we use it, we understand that it's going to be around a 20% saving if someone was to move into a uh, an energy efficient new build property rated A or a B on an EPC rating. Um, we've taken um, uh, some statistics which show that around 85% of all new build properties built tw um, since 2020 has an A or a B rating. And therefore, those customers who are buying those properties will um, benefit from that 20% saving. So we've used that ONS data to factor in to our affordability assessment to increased lending to customers buying new build properties post 2020 and rated uh, an A or a B on an EPC rating. And I've got a slide uh, next, which will show you the how that can impact your customers and the benefit it can offer them. So you see here, um, we've got uh, just a, a standard scenario. Um, this is actually a real life scenario that worked for one of our customers. So they're first time buyers and they've got a joint income of 55,000 with um, the first applicant having a loan commitment of 250 pounds and the second applicant having childcare costs of 500 pounds. They're looking to borrow over a 25 year term with a loan amount required of 165 and uh, the property value of 220 with a loan to value of 75%, uh, as I mentioned with one dependent. So these are some screenshots from our affordability calculator. I want to draw your attention to the uh, just to the bottom left hand corner of the slide on the left. Um, that shows that um, you've marked that the uh, property has been built pre 2020. So it means that in our view, it's second hand and therefore you're getting our, I suppose, our normal salary multiple. Um, and uh, yeah, so we know it's a second hand property. And based on that, we can lend one hundred fifty six thousand and sixty six pounds. So sadly, getting uh, uh, less than what they actually want. Now, now I would normally sort of ask for you all to put in some bids, but I don't think we're going to have time and the functionality to do that. So I'm going to skip forward onto the next screen. So um, we've now changed that the property is built um, from 2020 onwards. So therefore, the system now recognises that it's a uh, more energy efficient new build property built um, after 2020 and we can then lend 178,807 pounds which is an increase just shy of 23,000. So obviously this is a, a, a scenario that works very nicely um, to show you an example of this. I think the key things to, to remember when uh, using this for your customers is that the maximum that we can lend to someone is 4.7 times, 4.75 times their salary. So if you've got a customer who has got um, really good affordability, um, no dependents, um, no commitments, then the most the amount that we'll be able to lend them is 4.75. So if they don't have any uh, debts or children, it means it's very likely that that's what we're going to be lending them straight away. So there isn't any room for us to increase that, whereas it works very well with families um, who might have um, some debts or some children. So it means that rather than getting that 4.75 times salary straight off the bat, 
it means that they're going to be getting more like four times or four and a half times salary. So it builds in that bit of space where we can then use the um, energy efficiency of the property to increase the uh, loan amount that we're able to give them. That's it from me. Hand you back to Pam. Brilliant. Thanks, James. Um, uh, really good to see the work obviously that you're doing in terms of that affordability piece. And it actually leads on to a key question that I've got. Why isn't increased affordability for increased energy efficiency standard across the industry, obviously, given what we've heard this morning? Um, James, Richard, would one of you like to dive in and answer that question, please? Yeah, well, I, I, th I think the simple fact on that is that we're, we're really at a very nascent stage um, of the market on this. Um, I think for me, the, the, the key focus is um, the fact that more and more lenders are now supporting the green agenda. And we've got a variety of um, different innovations. Um, I think we will see the affordability piece and, and you know, just to be clear, massive hats off to Leeds um, for, for, for sort of leading on this and being the first um, accord have recently followed. Um, I think we're going to see a lot more lenders um, come to the party. Um, but yeah, there is a lot of good stuff happening um, from, from affordability uh, changes to education. Um, uh, yeah, there's a, a lot of lenders that are um, putting tools out there. Um, I think increasingly we'll see um, more partnerships with the like of with the likes of Luke and PropPro um, that that will um, enable um, people to find the right solutions to to, to green their home, um, and I, I think I think the big part that we've all got to play on this is really that sort of raising awareness and, and education. Um, uh, I think if you ask the average consumer, if you uh, you know, most people, we've got a stock issue in the UK, so most people buying a home, unless they're buying um, a new build property, are probably buying something that isn't perfect and they need to go and do some work to it. Um, if they had access, you know, the hardest part is finding a builder, um, a builder who's available and a builder who's affordable and the materials are affordable. Um, but if you gave most people the choice, you know, if, if it was going to cost you X to do it, um, uh, uh, in, in a certain way, but if it was going to cost you Y to do it and make your home more energy efficient, would you be prepared to pay a little bit more um, and it'd be good for the planet? I think most people would do that. Um, but we've, we need to sort of get to a point where the accessibility of the and awareness um, of, of what customers can do is, is um, uh, more readily available. Yeah, really great point, Richard. As we said, I think there's so many perceptions and myths, aren't there, that we need to actually all be tackling um, in unison to be able to drive that kind of knowledge and information. Um, so brilliant. I'm now going to take some questions from the live Q&A. It's great. We've had a couple of, in picking up on um, after Andrew's uh, presentation in particular. So now I'm going to open this out to the panel. So uh, Phil has said, I think many homeowners recognise the benefits of bringing their improvements to the homes, which I'm sure we we all agree but currently the ROI doesn't justify the cost. Um, how much do the panel see this changing as more adoption reduces cost and potentially government incentives come into play? So he'd like to take that one. Luke do you I want to go? I probably take that yeah. yeah. I suppose um, doesn't cur currently justify the ROI that the cost doesn't um, yeah, I, I think you, you need to unpack that a little bit. So, for example, solar panels, that's, you know, they, they've been decades around and actually the cost has come down and government incentives have been withdrawn. Um, I got solar, solar panels. The business case just stacks up. If it doesn't add the value to the property, you'll get it in energy savings for sure. Um, so I think what where the ROI tends to get a bit iffy is with whole house approaches to retrofit, where you might include some quite, uh, you know, potentially invasive, quite major works like ex internal or external wall insulation, um, you know, and, uh, yeah, floor insulation, that sort of thing. Um, and I think that's where you need to take a longer term view. So I think what benefits are you actually sort of incorporating in, into the sort of business case that you're doing? So, for example, if you take into account increased thermal comfort, um, you know, better financial stability. So let's say you're retiring um, and you want you know, low bills or, you know, consistently and sort of predictable um, bills. Uh, you've got other considerations um, than just sort of, you know, will it repay within five years? I think there's also a mindset shift that needs to take place that is not about when will I get my money back, but if I do these works, what is the 
net present value of doing these works? And then is that reflected in the, the property price, the property value? Um, or is it, you know, do you, do you get that through increased rental, rental yield, for example? Um, so, yeah, I think it's more nuanced than just than, you know, does the ROI justify it or not? It's you know, there's other benefits and I think mindset shifts that need to take place as well. Uh, and there are government incentives with, with heat pumps. So when when there is lower uptake, then that's where costs will come to come down with with volume for sure. Um, I don't know if anyone else has got some some points. Yeah, Richard, yeah, there's lots of nodding. Yeah, um, you can see me itching to come in there. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll take the other part of the of the question, um, which touched on government incentives. Um, so you know, that's absolutely what is needed now. Um, yeah, we, we we need proper intervention to to drive this. You know, and um, James alluded to the fact that uh, lenders have got targets to uh, become carbon neutral by a certain uh, by, by, by 2050. Um, you know, the, the, the country has as well. Um, and back to the point I made earlier, this, we're, we're at very nascent stages in the market. It, it requires some some bold thinking at the top um, and a long term um, housing policy and strategy um, to, to drive the, the appropriate change that we need. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think um, and there are a few things that potentially could happen. So Andrew touched on heat pumps, uh, uh, for example, at the moment, and the, the, the cost of uh, electricity versus versus gas. If the government were to make a change to drive down the cost of electricity, all of a sudden the value of heat pumps skyrockets. Um, uh, so, yeah, there, there's, there's things that could happen. I also think um, that they missed a trick by not doing something around stamp duty. Um, you know, Maggie, we've seen what a force for... Um, uh, uh, a positive impact on the market in terms of volume stamp duty incentives can be. But imagine if um, anyone buying a, an older property um, was incentivized on a, a stamp duty rebate to go and do um, home improvements that made the property more energy efficient, improve the EPC rating. Um, that would be an incentive to the consumer, but it would also flow lots of uh, other money back into the economy from the people who undertake the work and what have you. So there's, there's lots of things that can happen. We just need um, uh, uh, the, the, the government to lead on it so that lenders, brokers, prop tech and uh, uh, climate tech can, can support it. I think uh, just stepping on on that, and I don't want to focus on this one single point, but you know your return on your investment is very much based around the cost of the installation. We've just talked about that, but the cost of the fuel as well. Uh, you know when we have these cost of living crises, it does focus minds and it does flip that equation over. Um, I certainly don't want to see people being plunged into fuel poverty so that they have to make this decision. But you could perhaps look at it in a slightly different way. If, if the government were to say, right, well, we're, we're changing the EPC slightly. Um, we've got another metric on here, which is about carbon emissions, and we're going to start targeting that. That changes what becomes valuable. And if carbon then becomes more important, then we will see things like heat pumps becoming uh, more au fait and a bit more, more, more of a focus. And also things like insulation will, will have an added value because insulation does all the things. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm a big fan of, even if we could find this holy grail of a, sing, a single way of producing all the energy we ever need, um, we still really ought to reduce how much energy we're using. It just makes common sense. Anyway, I'll get off my sofa. <laughs> it's a good soap box to be on, I'd suggest, Andrew. Um, moving James, on, we've... Did, sorry, did you, Luke. I thought you... Did you have a comment uh, on yeah, that? Yeah, well? it was... It was just, sorry, uh, James. When, when looking at uh, the uh, return on investment, um, we've been working very closely with a developer in Nottingham, uh, Keepmate Homes, uh, that are building homes to the new future home standard. So it means that the, these homes are uh, going to reduce, in terms of from them being built, they're reducing the amount of carbon being produced in the build process by 90%. Um, and they're going to be lasting for 150 years. And the homes are going to run at around 50%, 57% less energy and at around 45% less cost. Now, uh, we've had the tricky uh, bit with that is working with our surveyors to help them to understand the added value in those properties versus the, the other homes on the site to make sure that we weren't suddenly going to get uh, a lot of down valuations and things along those lines. So, and one thing that, that keep most done something that's really interesting, they're not trying to gain any extra value on the extra technology and facilities that have been put in. It's purely just based on the value. And we have seen um, from our surveyors now, uh, uh, yeah, just a, a return on that. that they, those properties are being sold for more because of the 
uh, I suppose the long term investment that's gone gone into them and the energy savings that's based on it. And we're working really closely with them to assess how we can utilize that because these these aren't just a or b properties these are future home standards how can we work with them closely to make sure that we're then giving the customer the benefit of the affordability that they're going to get from the lower energy bill so uh, although in the retrofit piece it might not be perfect uh, yet but they're in the, when the future home standards come in i think that that's going to be yeah in the perfect position for us to be able to utilize more affordability for customers and there will be that return on investment I think that's really interesting, James, and I would love to see a future EPC show and demonstrate really clearly that those buildings have been built to those standards so that the consumer can make really good choices. And actually thinking about that, I think there's a broader question um, that would I'd like to put to the pa panel is around obviously the energy efficiency and how it affects the value of property. Because again, there's so much speculation. We have a, a question that's come in from Fiona Scott talking about the ROI um, and again, breaking down these myths about um, the investment uh, versus obviously the kind of payback. So thinking about that value of the property, um, would people like to just add in some insights into that, Luke? Perhaps? I think one part of this it is around perceptions right and yeah. almost self-fulfilling prophecies if we say it is worth this much and the net present value trans you know translates to property value then that is the standard and and it's just it's default right so i think it is around perception um i think fiona had uh, there was a question around heat pumps and i do i don't think it's the necessarily the investment case i think there's more questions around the practicality um so for example i my house is perfect for getting heat pumps but i'm not getting them right now because i would have to put it on my patio and i'm doing some work to my patio so i don't want to have to so so there's more of just a practical issue um but there are some homes where it is you know completely uh, right. Obviously, new builds, it should just be default. There should, you know, I don't know why we're building new builds now with, with gas boilers. It should just be heat pumps. It make, makes sense. And there are a number of like specific types of properties that do it does make sense for heat pumps. But um, I think mainly it's more about despair, you know, getting rid of those myths around uh, heat pumps. So even solar panels, like um, there's, even though that's it's much more uh, mainstream now, there are some people, well, oh, you know, um, you know, what does it look like? Will the, will the aesthetics affect the property value? It's like, no, it, it, it doesn't. Um, so, yeah, I, I do think we need to get around that. But I think crucially, and as affordability, as energy efficiency is taken into affordability much more, that will be an indirect link to value because the more um, buyers can afford for your property will increase the market for your property, which therefore drives demand. So uh, I do think as more and more lenders and i've spoken to quite a few and they're either thinking about it or starting to enact this anyway um you, you know i, I think there were, there's, there's going to be a more value uh, added to the, the property for, for sure and affordability will be driving that um, i totally agree with what luke's just said in terms of those uh, perception points I mean, it, 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 are we seeing a lot of information that demonstrates green in your home significantly adds value P probably not but again it's still very very early days on this and um, there is some good data out there and good research out there so uh, right move um obviously one of the largest but well, arguably the largest brand in property and um, uh, did their greener homes report and they i can read verbatim but uh, they, they said uh, that um greening a home uh, commands an additional price premium on on top of local house price growth, price growth with an average of almost £56,000 for homes that had improved their EPC rating from F to C. Um, so, yeah, there is uh, research out there that shows uh, the demand. Um, I think that's only going to grow, um, you know, just as... Um, covid uh, uh you know, that sort of typified people looking for a different type of home the race for space you know we all wanted a room that we could work from or a bit more green space and you know sort of lots of talk of the exodus from cities and things like that I, I think the um impact of the cost of living crisis and energy bills will have shifted people's mindsets on uh, quite drastically on wanting to find a more energy efficient home um, and as I say, it's probably fairly early days. And um, certainly in um, the rental market and landlords, again, right move data, they said one in five tenants um, is actively um, uh, seeking something that's more cost effective for them, you know, cheaper bills. Um, so d does it currently impact value significantly today? Who knows? It certainly impacts saleability, lettability, desirability of the property. 
Brilliant, it's a great one. We've actually got a question. It is a bit of a deep dive, but I think it's worth kind of unpicking a little bit. Um, we have somebody who said, we've been told we can't have them. I'm assuming that's around the heat pump piece due to the ground on which our house over 25 years old is built from. Again, you know, we know that there's some really specific points here, but in terms of being under, uh, how, how as an industry we can start to, to obviously, as we say, break down some of these perceptions. Does anyone have come back on the kinds of, um, response for that you know you've got a house that desperately wants to do something and there's some critical barriers andrew i can see you nodding i'm thinking i might be thinking as i speak so here we go um a heat pump isn't for every property every property can't have a heat pump um but there are lots and lots of different ways of doing them um but if you can't go heat pump that's fine there you know there are things like high heat retention storage heaters as an example you know they they're really really clever and can work on variable tariffs and and that might be one solution um it might be that something else comes along that that allows it but i i think if it's an air source heat pump usually they can be located pretty much anywhere as long as sort of the noise abatement pieces is is is, is, is observed um, and that might be uh, the trick um certainly on flats is quite difficult i would imagine um but again it, it it all comes down to the fact that you know where we are today isn't going to be where we are in sort of five ten years time this is a moving feast and the world is going to change and what doesn't work now may work in five years time ten years time but that also doesn't stop people doing stuff now right uh solar panel so i um, had a thermal survey uh, done on my property, detected a number of uh, areas where there were gaps. I got spent 30 quid on sealant and expanding foam, you know, addressed those, those bits and it improved my sort of the warmth of my, my home. I've got solar panels and a battery. Um, you know, there, there are things that you can do now, loft insulation, cavity wall insulation. A lot of these have do, do good um, uh, you know, net present value. Um, I think yeah, it's just there are certain circumstances where heat pumps might not be suitable for you. Um, but there are, like you said, high heat retention uh, storage heaters. There are like heat, like new technology heat bat batteries coming on. I looked at those. They're really interesting as well. Um, so, yeah, that, that, it doesn't mean that you should not do anything. And I think one of my points in my presentation was it is an ongoing journey to net zero. Um, and so they might start off with some low level you know, LED lighting, loft insulation, some low cost, um, uh, you know, pieces. But then in a few years time, they might get solar panels. A couple of years after that, when the boiler breaks down, yeah, it might be suitable to have a heat pump or an alternative, you know, uh, infrared heating, uh, uh, high, high yeah, storage heaters, that sort of thing. Um, yeah. So I think key point is act now, but it is an ongoing journey. <clears throat> it loops back round, doesn't it? Sorry, yeah, sorry, Richard. Just to build on that, Luke, you know, it, it, it's not also just about the home. Um, it's also about consumption and behaviour as 100%, well. And I yeah. think to, to your point, Luke, you know, it, it, everybody can genuinely make a difference. If we all take the attitude sort of, yeah, you know, I, I, I won't do anything until I can get a heat pump, then you know, we're not going to address this problem at all. Um, so uh, it's 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 for homeowners you know thinking about the appliances that they buy for example you know can, can they buy a washing machine dishwasher things that are more energy efficient that are more cost effective for them longer term and i think yeah we we we, we sort of need to see a big mindset shift in in behind this so it's, it's not just about the epc rating but it's about what happens in the home as well um and i think gradually we'll see um uh, technology education awareness that supports that um uh, come into play and and the challenge for brokers, so, sorry, Pam, the challenge for brokers and the opportunity for brokers is making sure they've got flexible products. They understand the needs of their customers. So even if they're not doing retrofitting right now, in a few years time when they might want to, they've got maybe additional borrowing from you know, green lending from their, their, their lender, for example, um, or they've got flexible products, which they're, they're able to finance some of these more major works. Um, so I think that's where the opportunity is. Yeah, just picking up on that, I think you know, we were talking about the uh, opportunity. Actually, no, James, dive in. Sorry, I'm not going to cut you out again. Carry on before we lose I, a thread. I don't mean uh, uh, to be the, uh, I suppose, mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that everyone's been there so positive about it. But if you are planning on, or your customer is planning on getting these changes uh, made to their property, whether it be installing solar panels, uh, um, 
uh, getting cavity insulation put in, uh, urge your customers to check with their lender and insurer that they're okay with the changes that are being made. There are some uh, changes um, and you know, there are some solar panel providers that if those were to be to put on properties with uh, Leeds Building Society, then it could mean that the, that, would, that that mortgage would then fall out of bed with us. And so it's really important that you check with your lender uh, if you've got a mortgage on the property and with your insurer to make sure that they're okay with the changes that are being made. Yeah, really important point, James. Thank you. Um, so looping back, I think, again, listening to the panel, we've heard uh, around what are the opportunities for brokers in terms of that engagement, you know, the principles of fabric first, thinking about the renewable energy solutions that might be applicable to their properties. And actually, as you said, taking them on that journey, which is, uh, yeah, little interventions can still drive down um, and improve, obviously, efficiency. Talking about efficiency and actually when uh, customers and homeowners should be thinking about about actually doing um, or taking on um, interventions. How does seasonality affect people um, when they want to retrofit? Again, getting people in the mindset. We've talked so much of this as a shift of mindset and that seasonality piece is probably quite a, an important trigger point. Does anybody want to come back and uh, give thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Andrea. I, Sorry, I'm you go, you, you go yeah. ahead. So, yeah, I suppose it's just being aware that, you know, it, renovations happen year round. It's just a different type of improvements that uh, might take more precedence in certain um, quarters of the year. So, you know, when people start firing up their boilers in sort of October time and they start breaking <laughs> and they need to replace their, their heating system, those types of solutions, you know, tend to sort of uh, come to the fore. When it's springtime now, a lot of people start committing to solar panels because, oh, it's getting lighter. Um, you know, I want to take advantage of, of this for the for the summer. Um, so, yeah, it's just really uh, understanding that uh, you know, in terms of when you, if you do want to engage your customers in energy efficiency, uh, you know, and maybe in marketing campaigns, that, to just taking that into account. And it might be different from your your sort of current rhythm um, in terms of like the property market, whether it's remortgages or uh, when people buy properties, uh, it might be a slightly different um, yeah, rhythm to that. Andrew, do yeah. you want to add to that? Uh, it's kind of like people buying soft top cars, isn't it? And convertibles. It's like, oh, the summer's coming up. I would like, I'd like a convertible. It is, it is right. We do see these sort of peaks and troughs year round, but um, uh, it, it is important to note as well that when there are, sort of peaks within uh, people's interest it tends to be a, a, a some some difficulty finding an installer that can install it in that period of time um, and inversely you might get a better a better deal or a, a, dead, a, a more availability when there isn't so much demand um, it, it is also important to stress that certain things certain interventions are more difficult in winter they're naturally installed in summer so external wall insulation once the temperature gets quite low isn't it isn't the best time to be doing it because of the way it's applied to the property um so that's worth bearing in mind brilliant thank you um I moving on to a sorry winter, richard winter as well sorry to cut cut in but the uh, um uh who who delayed turning on their heating for as long as humanly possible um, uh, post you know, rising energy bills and cost of living crisis. So, yeah, of course it has an impact. You know, um, I think with all the rising costs, you know, I spend half my time running around our house shouting at my kids to turn the lights <laughs> on because, because the, the rising cost of everything in the last couple of years has given a demonstrable impact to what we all spend on our on our on our bills. Um, so, yeah, I think um, the, the, the impact is seeing sort of get colder. I mean, we, we, we had a couple of heat waves and you know, a lot of people uh, in the last couple of years over summer and you know, lots of my friends were talking about the, be bemoaning the fact that the UK doesn't have a culture of, of air conditioning like we do on the continent. Yeah, that that might start to have an impact as climate change becomes more and more paramount. Yeah, this is this is this is only going one way unless we take drastic action. Yeah, really key point there. Um, actually, I'd like the panel to answer technical questions. So what do brokers need to provide to get enhanced affordability? So I think this is one for you, James. So in terms of that, do they need to provide EPC? Uh, yeah, so uh, we've already assessed the, the risk based on this due to um, using the ONS data. So uh, they don't have to provide anything. As soon as they've ticked the uh, box to say that it's been built post 2020, our system automatically assumes that it's um, uh, a new build property and therefore they're getting the enhanced affordability assessment. 
our application system can also uh, pick it up uh, because it's that point that we'll ask more details about the property and therefore we'll ask when the year the property was built. So if the broker was to miss out on that, on the affordability assessment, doing the decision in principle or the um, uh, affordability assessment using the calculator, then our application system will then pick it up when they put in the, um, uh, the property details and give that extra bit of affordability. Great. Um, we've got another one, which is uh, how do we prioritise engaging customers um, against competing demands like protection? So, Richard, would you like to answer that one? Yeah, so um, I think this goes back to the point I made earlier where we, we're seeing lots of um, initiatives from lenders, various different ones, affordability tweaks. Um, you know, we've had another lender, NatWest, have actually paid um, for nine customers to, to retrofit their home. Um, uh, we've got nationwide offering zero percent finance. So there's there's lots of things that actually, you know, in a in a, a lending climate where um, margins are tight for lenders, um, they are sort of putting their money where their mouth is and making solutions. I actually think, given the point I made earlier about brokers being the catalyst, the gateway to good advice, um, uh, lenders could actually make it easier for brokers by incentivizing them. Um, and, you know, lenders need to to, to um, make their back books more carbon neutral. They've got in the broker market, they've got an entire workforce at their disposal. Um, where if it was um, you know, a greater reward, you know, because if, if a customer needs a twenty five grand further advance to go and get solar panels or put in a heat pump or make small changes, there's not a great incentive for a broker to advise on that. Um, so I think lenders can actually um, uh, back lenders to support them in helping do this. That's an innovation that I'd love to see. Um, of course, very, very selfish commercial angle from a, a man that runs a brokerage. So, um, Richard, are you saying to increase proc fees based on the energy efficiency <laughs> of uh, the mortgage that, that we get? Potentially, yeah. You know, if, if it is a case of um, single applications that are offering demonstrable um, impact to the energy efficiency of the home, that is a potential answer. You know, again, back to the nationwide uh, uh, further advance, that they're giving away the financing for free, but there's been very little take up. You know, um, I, I think that's a potential solution. It's back to the point we need radically different thinking beyond product on this. Mm. Yeah, as I said, absolute plaudits to you guys for what you've done on affordability. This is potentially another different angle. Um, you know, it's, it's not a, to, to the point Andrew made, there, is, there isn't a one size solution, uh, a, a one size fits all solution in greening the home. There shouldn't be a one size fits all solution in mm. um, driving the impact of the market. I, I'm, I'm Richard, I, I completely agree. And I think part of this is firstly making it you know, as simple as possible for the broker and if, if anything as you know no work at all uh, but at the moment as you say like that's you know more effort than than what it would probably cost in terms of time to sort of set and advise on on those um uh, like the 0% finance for example and i think instead of the bank paying this is where we come in and we're offering an incentive as well so commit like up to 700 pounds for for doing those those retrofit works which the improvement suppliers would have to spend anyway in terms of direct marketing and channels. So the, the consumer's not being, um, in fact, they're, they're, we're getting bulk discounts for consumers, so passing that on to them, plus then the, the lender, uh, the, the, the broker wins as well in terms of, uh, you know, getting some, uh, you know, making it actually juicy enough for them to, you know, make it worth their while when there are competing demands like insurance protection and that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, good point. James, did you want to come in on that? Uh, yeah, uh, I suppose in the spirit of things of um, thinking while I'm speaking while I'm thinking, uh, the challenges of uh, you know being able to incentivise brokers, um, you know, through uh, proc fee, that's that would be very tricky for us to to put into place. I'm guessing it would be tricky for the brokers to uh, regarding the advice process of wanting to make sure that you uh, not being swayed by different lenders on based on how much they're paying would, would be a, a tricky situation to be in as well. Um, so you, like what Rich says, it's not, we have to go past what we're doing at the moment, you know, green mortgages, it's been fantastic. We've seen a, a massive increase in the amount of, uh, you know, from only just two years ago, the amount of green products that are available but you know, being really honest and been sat in the room where we're trying to design those products, none of them have been 
market leading where you want to go away and shout about it it's you know the couple of bips off here 500 quid cash back there it's not anything that's really going to have a massive impact so yeah i suppose rich is right we need to start thinking outside the box and if if that means looking at um different ways of uh, uh incentivizing breakers then it's, it's a discussion we can have Great. Mindful of time, we're now at 29 minutes past, so we're going to be closing our webinar for today. So I'd like to do a huge thanks to all of our panellists for attending and sharing their expertise. Uh, to our listeners, fantastic. Thank you very much for um, coming online and speaking to us today.